Dominant logic is a method of using dynamic gates that allows us to get over the cascading effects uh, without having to use pull-up networks. So the problem with using, with, with using uh, NP logic is that we have to use P stages, and the P stages use P MOS transistors. And so we have a pull-up network here instead of a pull-down network. What this causes us is it causes us to see a C external from all N stages that come from pull-up networks. Pull-up networks are in general undesirable. They are part of the reason that CMOS is uh, slow because pull-up networks consist of PMOS transistors. Due to the inferior mobility of PMOS, this causes us to size the PMOSs in the pull-up network to be uh, larger than a corresponding NMOS, uh, which causes us to see more self-loading on the output node, but more importantly, more external loading on the previous stages. So in general, the use of NP logic is discouraged if we can find a way that uses only NMOS uh, or pull down uh, dynamic gates. And this method is called domino logic. And in domino logic, we have a dynamic gate that consists of a pull down network, so only and MOS, but this is not our building block. So our building block is no longer just the dynamic gate. It is the dynamic gate followed by a static CMOS inverter. And so this is a static CMOS inverter or a normal CMOS inverter. And now this is our building block. So the inputs are the clock signals and the inputs, and the output is not taken at this node, but it's actually taken at the output of the static gate. And so this node, this node, the output of the dynamic gate, is an internal node to the stage and is not accessible. It is not an output. You cannot take it and feed it to another gate. You can only take the output of the uh, static CMOS inverter. And so basically, uh, think of it this way. You can make an AND gate and an OR gate instead of an AND gate and an OR gate because you have an inherent additional inversion that comes from this static CMOS inverter. And so why does dominant logic help us? Why is it good? Why does it uh, remove the effects of cascading? Let's look at uh, the same example we looked at when we did cascading. Uh, so we have a first inverter whose input is in one, and we expect to see output two equal to input one during the evaluate phase, because that's when logic is evaluated. So let's look at how, uh, how this happens. So during the first pre-charge, the node X1 is going to pre-charge up to VDD. So node out1 is going to be at zero volt. It's not going to be at VDD, right? Because X1 is at VDD and out1 is the static inversion of X1. So notice that out1 is always the inversion of X1 with like a propagation delay. And out2 is always the inversion of X2. Whether we are in the pre-charge phase or in the evaluate phase, it doesn't matter because these inverters are static inverters. If these inverters were dynamic inverters th themselves, we would have, you know, cascaded the problem. We had, would have made it b bigger. So they have to be static inverters. And so output two is also going to be zero volt during the pre-charge phase. Now, during the first evaluate phase, the input in one is equal to one. This is the condition actually that caused us problems uh, in the previous videos because it's the condition during which uh, the in input of the inverter, the second inverter, was 1 and then dropped to 0, causing the second inverter to, to lose some of its high impedance charge and not be able to replace it again. So let's see what's happening here. What's happening here is that the input, input 1, is equal to 1. This causes the node X1 to discharge down from VDD to 0 volt. But out1 is the inversion of X1. So out1 is going to charge up to VDD as X1 discharges down to zero volt. So out one is gonna go up to VDD instead of going down to zero volt. It's gonna go up to VDD. And so when we look at the input of M2, the input of M2 takes some time to reach a value of two V threshold. So M2 wants to turn on because the input to M2 is supposed to be one, but it takes some time to become a one. So this taking some time, this delay is what caused us the cascading problem in the first place. But in this case, all, all that's going to happen is that output 2 is supposed to turn from 0 to 1 as X2 discharges from VDD to 0 volt. M2 is taking its sweet time to turn on so that it can discharge X2. But when it eventually does so, it's going to discharge 
X2 and out 2 is going to charge up to VDD and therefore we will see the correct output on output 2. So the problem is solved. Why is the problem solved? Because the problem was that we entered the end stage with an output that was equal to 1 and then that output dropped to 0. In this case, we go in with an input that is equal to 0 volt and then that input could go up. So delay in this case is only in the first and the output of the first stage is only going to cause the second stage to be delayed a little bit, but it's not going to cause it to lose irreplaceable high impedance charge, right? But of course we have to uh, take a look at um, at the other input case when input one is equal to zero because maybe we solved this problem and then we created a problem for the case where there was no problem. So what's going to happen during the second pre-charge? During the second pre-charge, X1 is going to pre-charge to VDD, which causes out one to discharge to zero. And out two is also going to pre-charge to VDD. Uh, so X2 is also going to pre-charge to VDD, which causes out two to go down to zero. Of course, these guys, out one and out two, are going to take the some time, which is the uh, propagation delay of the static inverters to go down, but that's fine. Eventually, we enter the second evaluate phase with output 1 and output 2 equal to 0 volt. Now, when we enter the second evaluate, input 1 is also equal to 0 volt. This causes X1 to remain at VDD. So X1 is going to remain at VDD and X1 is going to be high impedance. Out one, on the other hand, is going to remain at zero volt because X1 is remaining at VDD. But out one is a zero volt that comes from low impedance. So out one is a zero volt that comes from low impedance. Out one is the input to the second stage. It causes M2 to be cut off which causes X2 to preserve its pre-charge of VDD and this causes out 2 to remain at zero volt as well. So input 1 was 0 volt, output 2 was 0 volt. When input 1 was VDD, output, one, output 2 was VDD. So we managed to cascade the two stages and get output values in their full. So why is it that we solved the cascading problem? Why is it that we managed to solve the cascading problem? We managed to do so because we allowed the input of the end stages to begin the evaluate phase at zero volt and then go up to VDD or remain at zero volt. The problem is that when we did not use intermediate CMOS inverters, the input to any dynamic stage began at VDD, that's during uh, pre-charge, so the input began at VDD and either dropped to zero or remained at VDD. When it remained at VDD, we did not have a problem. But when it dropped to zero, that was problematic because it caused the upcoming stage to see an input that was a logic one for some time and then turned into a zero, which causes a, an irretrievable loss of charge. This is also the reason why NP logic solves the cascading problem, because it allows us to obtain an output that starts out at zero and either rises or remains at zero. But in that case, the output comes from a P stage, not from the output of a static CMOS inverter. So which is better, using an additional CMOS inverter or using P stages? One can contest that perhaps the additional CMOS uh, inverters are uh, an overhead, and this is true, but recall that if these stages, if the dynamic stages are bigger gates, uh, these still remain simple inverters, and so the overhead becomes relatively smaller. Also notice that there is an overhead to using NP logic, which is that we have to use PMOS transistors and pull-up networks in the P stages, and PMOS transistors tend to be big to compensate for mobility, which is an issue, it's a problem. Again, you know, is there a need for tail NMOS transistors in this case? As with NP logic, we don't need the NMOS transistors, the clock NMOS transistors, because the only task of the uh, uh, NMOS transistor is to cut off the path to ground while we are pre-charging the output node. Note that the inputs to all of these stages now come from uh, static CMOS inverters. And so during pre-charge, these inputs during pre-charge are always going to be zero. So we always have inputs equal to zero during pre-charge. This means that the pull-down network itself will take care of cutting uh, off the path to ground during pre-charge. And so we don't need the tail end MOS transistors. To be more specific, 
We need a tail end MOS transistor only for the very first stage because we don't know where the input is coming from. As soon as we get the input in the proper, proper pre-charge evaluate format, we don't actually need these uh, NMOS clock transistors anymore.